Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited to bring to the stage Secretary of the Army, Christine Wormuth. Let's give her a big welcome from Fort Benning. Madam Secretary, the floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Please sit down. Good morning, everyone, and thanks, General Buzzard, for the introduction. I am so pleased to be here today at Fort Benning. Uh, this is my first visit, actually, to Fort Benning. I'm sure it won't be my last, but I'm delighted uh, to help open uh, the Warfighter Conference this morning. Obviously, Fort Benning plays a really foundational role in Army readiness and is leading the way in innovation for Army infantry and armor as we move towards becoming the Army of 2030. As you all know, the, the entire joint force is at an inflection point. After spending two decades engaged in counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, we are once again faced uh, focusing on nation state challenges. And unlike the time sort of when I was growing up and going through college, when we were focused solely on the Soviet Union, now we have to think not just about Russia, but also about the pacing challenge that China presents. And the nation state challenges that we're confronting now pose different and more difficult operational problems than the Soviet Union did in the waning days of the Cold War. As you all likely know, today and tomorrow's battlefield is going to become increasingly transparent. Sensing technologies from smartphones to UAS to passive radars and satellites are going to just continue to proliferate. Army forces are going to be under constant observation and what can be seen can be targeted. You only have to look as far as the battlefields in Ukraine to know what this means for ground forces. Sanctuaries are also rapidly becoming a thing of the past. The Joint Force is not going to have the luxury of safe APODs and SPODs. The advent of longer range fires, cyber attacks, and again, the proliferation of UAS on the battlefield means that anyone can come under attack, whether you're on the forward edge of the battlefield, whether you're in the rear areas, or even if you're in the homeland. And as my friend Dave Johnson, who I think is gonna be talking to you all later in the conference, has been saying for several years, the battlefield is already becoming a more crowded place. It isn't just military forces against military forces. It's also groups like the Wagner Group, private contractors. It is uh, cyber hackers, criminal organizations, and proxy forces. And in many cases, those proxies are equipped with pretty advanced technologies. And of course, we've also, I think, all come to appreciate the profound importance that information and disinformation is going to play on the battlefield in future conflicts. And finally, for ground forces in particular, the future will likely present complex, multi-axis combined arms fights on an expanded, non-continuous battlefield that features dispersed forces ground forces are going to need to pay attention to their sea flanks and air flanks. You all are the future leaders of the Army, the officers that are going to lead the Army of 2030 and who will be the senior leaders for the Army of 2040 and beyond. So today is really, I think, a perfect opportunity for me to share with you how I envision the Army doing its part to ensure that the Joint Force can prevail on the future battlefield. And to succeed on the battlefield and continue to dominate the land domain, I think the Army of 2030 needs to be able to do six things successfully. First, we have to ensure that the Army can see more, farther, and more persistently at every echelon than our adversaries. Second, the Army of 2030 has got to be able to converge dispersed deceptive forces at optimal times to strike hard against enemy targets. Third, we've gotta be able to win the fires fight, working with our sister services by shaping the battlefield, providing deep interdiction of lucrative enemy targets, and by rapidly attacking massing enemy forces. Fourth, 
and this one's really important because if we don't do this right, then the first three aren't going to matter. Our army has to be able to protect ourselves using integrated layered capabilities to offset our vulnerabilities as frequently as we can. Fifth, we've got to be able to communicate and share data rapidly, not just among ourselves, but also with our sister services and our coalition partners. And finally, and again, this is a really important one, the Army of 2030 has got to be able to sustain the fight to be able to do post operations and to be able to endure in a protracted conflict. On this kind of battlefield, we've got to constantly look to create advantages for ourselves that we can direct against enemy weaknesses. This is an idea that you all know is really central to maneuver warfare. And at the strategic level, where we've got a network of allies and partners that offer a lot of advantages, down to the tactical level, where the training, cohesion, and initiative of our small units give us real advantages, I believe, against the more rigid, less well-trained forces of our adversaries on what will in certainly be a chaotic battlefield. As the character of the future battlefield changes and as nation states grow more sophisticated, the Army hasn't been standing still. To the contrary, we have refocused everything we're doing from doctrine to force design to modernization so that the Army of 2030 will be able to do the six things that I just outlined. And I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking in a little bit more detail about how we are transforming to do each of those things. Because frankly, what I found is, and this is particularly true, I think, when we talk to our friends in Congress and to external audiences, we are such a large organization and we are such a complex organization that sometimes we can lose sight of the forest because we're looking at all of the individual trees. So first, like I said, Army forces have got to be able to see farther, see more and more persistently than our enemies. So to do that, we are doing a number of things, including modernizing our aerial ISR systems. The multi-domain sensing system comprised of the Hades manned platform, as well as unmanned elements, is going to provide us more sensing for joint targeting at the theater level. We will also have an expanded family of UAS that will do the same at the division, brigade, and battalion level. The terrestrial layer system, which is often called TILUS Brigade and TILUS EAB or Echelon Above Brigade, will give us imagery, radar, and electromagnetic ISR capabilities at every level from battalion up to theater. Titan is going to connect our Army forces at the brigade, division, and core level to robust commercial, national, and joint ISR capabilities. And at the tactical level, IVAS will enable platoons even at the front edge of the battle space to see more of the common operational picture than ever before. And even before the first shot is even fired, our new multi-domain task forces and theater military intelligence brigades equipped with AI-enhanced systems are going to allow us to collect, exploit, and share information about the environments in the Indo-Pacific and Europe so that our Army forces know as much as possible as much as possible about the adversary disposition of forces before a conflict even starts. Second, the Army of 2030 is going to be able to converge forces that have been dispersed and engaged in deceptive practices so that they can avoid being seen to then concentrate combat power and strike hard at decisive points in the battle. Our forces will use hide sites, decoys, and highly mobile command posts to be able to distribute C2 nodes, air defense assets, and sustainment forces in unpredictable ways. To do this, we are investing in a, in a faster, more survivable armored fist. Upgraded tanks and Bradleys will be joined by AMP Vs, which are already being fielded now. These new vehicles are going to enable the fire supporters engineers, medics, command posts, and logistics trains to keep up with the combat elements. Close combat forces are also becoming more lethal, leveraging the stronger punch of next generation squad weapons, as well as the enhanced night vision goggles and IVAS. And the mobile protective firepower system, which we just awarded the contract to General Dynamics, 
is going to provide greater protection to infantry forces without sacrificing speed or mobility. And we're going to have robotic vehicles that will provide an additional close combat force multiplier, assisting with everything from carrying heavy loads to, bre to breaching and providing close-in fires. And finally, we're reorganizing our combat engineers in battalions at the division level and investing in selected modernized bridging capabilities to ensure we will be able to conduct a major river crossing, something that we've seen is a pretty complicated endeavor, again, when you look at uh, how the Russians have done in Ukraine, but also to be able to do a deliberate combined arms breach or to rapidly in place our own obstacle defenses. Third, we've got to win the fires fight alongside our sister services. And again, you only have to look to Ukraine to see the importance of fires. Since 2016, the Army has been significantly investing in fire support systems, and we've made long-range precision fires one of our major modernization portfolios. Recognizing that both China and Russia have fire capabilities that significantly outrange us in some cases and outnumber us, we're in the process of growing our artillery formations and improving their range, their rate of fire, their lethality, and mobility from everything from longer barreled howitzers to hypersonic weapons. We're increasing the number of field artillery units that can deploy quickly to a crisis and that are going to be forward postured to deter adversaries. So we've already put uh, one of our MDTFs in Europe forward as well as the Indo-Pacific and we have a plan to do the same with our new mid-range capability and eventually with the longer range hypersonic weapons batteries the first of which will be fielded in FY23. We're really working tirelessly to ensure that we've got multiple options for fires that range from 40 miles, that's IRCA, all the way to more than 1,700 miles, which is the long-range hypersonic weapon. So this will be a real step forward in terms of our fire's capability. Fourth, like I said, if we can't protect ourselves, the first three things that I talked about are not going to mean very much. We have got to be able to protect ourselves using layered integrated electronic warfare and cyber capabilities as well as counter UAS and integrated air and missile defenses. To survive, our army formations are going to require improved mobility and the use of camouflage, decoys, and hide sites to reduce visual and electromagnetic signatures. And I've seen some of the work we're doing uh, directly. For example, I was out at 4th ID at Forks Carson and saw some of the work they're doing to really try to uh, increase the mobility of our um, command posts. To protect our maneuver forces in this area against a wider range of air threats, we're continuing to field MSHORAD. By the end of FY23, we're going to have our first battalion of MSHORAD out in UCOM and we will begin fielding our 2nd Battalion to Forcecom. We're also developing an enduring indirect fire protection capability, IFPIC, that will work together with the Army's, uh, this is a mouthful, Integrated Missile Defense Battle Control System, IBCS, and that will give us a really unparalleled ability to identify, track, and defeat aerial threats. This is going to be a really important step forward for our air defense forces. And again, if you just look at current events, whether it's Ukraine or what we saw in Nagorno-Karabakh a few years ago, it highlights the proliferation and significance of enemy unmanned aerial systems. To get ahead of this threat, we are investing in counter UAS division sets that are going to put fixed, semi-fixed, mobile and portable counter UAS capabilities in the hands of our maneuver forces. This is a really important area that we're investing in uh, General McConville will also will often talk about saying, you know, if you're a venture capitalist, investing in counter UAS capabilities is where it's at, because this is really something that we've got to up our game on. Fifth, key to our ability to perform all of these critical kinetic functions is being able to communicate and share data rapidly. Again, not just between Army formations, but also with our sister services and our coalition partners. We will, uh, you know, I think we've seen from history that from now on we are, we are not going to be going into battle by ourselves. We will, go, we will go, be going in with allies and partners. 
So to do that, part of what we're doing is the improved tactical network, which is being fielded right now. And this iteration of ITN is going to give us improved classified transport with better network bandwidth that will help us with efficiency and also the resiliency of our relay links. We're doing a lot of exper experimentation, excuse me, through Project Convergence. Uh, this is a series of experiments led by Army Futures Command down in Austin. And we've shown that using IBCS, we can actually share data beyond Army formations. We, are, we have been demonstrating through Project Convergence that we can connect far-flung joint sensors to Army shooters. We've demonstrated that we can um, rapidly combine targeting data from our joint teammates, whether it's an F-35 or a Marine radar, and pass that information to the correct Army fires element and really rapidly reduce the targeting cycle to just a couple of minutes. And I think this is just the beginning of what we need to do to become a more data-centric Army. I see even more assured access to data at even lower levels as a really critical capability. Our ongoing transition to the data cloud is going to allow our formations to harness targeting situational awareness and logistics data down to the battalion level. And finally, uh, something that's often overlooked and really undervalued, I think, is that we have got to be able to sustain the fight so that Army forces are ready to engage in um, pulsed operations that can be very sort of quick and lethal, but also to engage in a protected conflict. And I think this is where we have the most work yet to do as a service. As I've said in some other venues, I think one of our key Army roles in a joint fight in the Indo-Pacific is going to be not just to sustain ourselves, but to provide logistics and sustainment support to the rest of the joint force across the vast distances of the Indo-Pacific. And if we're going to do that, we have to not only be able to, to sustain ourselves during the fight, but we've got to be able to get to the fight, and that's going to be much harder in a more contested environment. Like I talked about, you know, we could be fighting from fort all the way to the port. The Russians and the Chinese have, have capabilities, both cyber capabilities and kinetic capabilities, to try to disrupt us as we try to project power out of the continental United States. So we're going to have to not just look at the everyday equipment, things like fuelers and trucks, but also niche capabilities like Army watercraft and joint logistics over the shore. We've got to really start putting logistics at the forefront of our planning, not just, and our preparation and our, and our training, rather than sometimes I think treating them as a little bit of an afterthought and assuming that they're always going to be there. Um, so I think our, our logistics folks have a lot of work to do. The Army of 2030 is not just new materiel and organizations. You know, we are going to be publishing our new multi-domain operations um, doctrine, FM3, in later this month, in October, excuse me. And I, I would commend the document to all of you as our future leaders, uh, knowing how central doctrine is to the United States Army. And I want to close by saying that modernizing how we train and continuing to improve our leader development and our professional military education are also essential components of the historic transformation to the Army of 2030. Well-led, highly trained, disciplined formations are core to what makes our Army the greatest Army in the world. The professionals here at the Maneuver Center of Excellence and our other centers of excellence across our enterprise are really critical to this effort. And you all, our future leaders, are the fruits of all of that labor. At the end of the day, I think, you know, when you boil down all of the words that are going to be in FM3 and you boil it down to its essence, it's really about how do we do the six things that I talked about today. How do we maneuver our forces to defeat an opponent by seizing the initiative going on the offense using deception, dislocation, and disruption. I think if our Army can do the six things that I've outlined and that are at the heart of multi-domain operations, we can be confident that we'll prevail on the battlefield. So thanks so much for your attention, and I look forward to hearing from you all.
Madam Secretary, I'll uh, kind of uh, MC here. We, we do have time for a few questions from the audience. And uh, audience members at this time, if you do have questions, please raise your hand. Uh, someone with a microphone will come to your location, and then I'll call on you. Um, and if you're virtual, please put that in the chat box. And uh, Madam Secretary, as we're waiting for the first question from the audience, I'll just ask one of my own. Um, acknowledging the war fighting priorities that you just laid out, we, um, I know that you met with the Army Science Board recently. Could you tell us about that engagement and then what direction you're giving that board as you look at some of the gaps in, uh, uh, from a science perspective, uh, given those priorities that you just laid out? Thank you. Sure. Uh, yes, I did just meet with the new chair and vice chair of our Army Science Board. And um, in the past, the, the Army Science Board, I think, has, has done a lot of great work for the Army, but it's been very, very technical and very, very specific. Uh, we're, we're blessed in the Army, and I see General, I think I saw General Rainey out there somewhere. Um, we get a lot of great technical support from places like the Rand Arroyo Center, for example. And I think what really makes the Army Science Board different uh, is, is the membership of the Science Board. And I've worked with um, Army senior leaders to try to, frankly, select um, a lot of folks on the Science Board who are not just scientists, but are, frankly, you know, former senior leaders, some in the Army, some from other um, professions, who can give me and General McConville and General George and Gabe Camarillo, the Undersecretary, and others more strategic um, experience the, and give us the benefit of their actual practical experience. Um, because what I really want to do is, is leverage um, the experience of senior leaders in ways that are really practical. I don't, you know, you all don't need uh, answers to questions two years from now. You all need answers to questions, you know, three to six months from now, in my experience. And so I'm going to try to focus the Army Science Board on um, dealing with higher level questions and giving us, you know, their insights about those questions sooner uh, rather than, you know, kind of letting the perfect be, the, um, sort of letting the best be the enemy of the good. That's kind of the guidance I gave them. They, they can, you know, give me ideas about what they think the hard questions are, but, but I wanted to aim them at kind of the right kinds of questions and the speed of getting back to us. Great. Thank you. Okay, out to the audience. Don't be shy. All right, Hello, got, uh, panel two. This thing please. on. Hi, ma'am. I'm Captain Doyle. I'm a student in MCCC right now. Thank you for coming out here. Um, I have a question about something that I'm pretty sure everybody in this room, you know, has heard about in some way or another. Um, we've seen, a, uh, especially in the wake of COVID sort of a precipitous drop in the number of both willing and uh, capable applicants into the Army. I have friends both up at Sand Hill and who work in recruiting, and I'm sure we all do. Their, uh, their stories can be, you know, a little bit shocking at times. Going into these large-scale conflicts, and especially with the drastic need, as you said, for the ability to maintain and endure, especially after enduring attrition during what these conflicts will most likely bring to our organization. My question to you is, do you think that we are reaching the limits of what the volunteer force can provide, especially given these conflicts on the horizon? And do you personally see that there might be a need to change that concept for how we structure our force? Um, an example I would give is, you know, two years ago after the assassination of Soleimani, um, the selective service site uh, crashed due to the number of civilians who were checking to see if they were eligible to be drafted. Um, this is something that you have no doubt thought of and uh, have a much better picture of, and I'd like to get your opinion on. Sure, okay, sorry, it's a, with the acoustics, it's a little bit hard to hear, but I think what I heard you asking is, you know, given the challenges and sort of the, the pretty formidable operational challenges that our Army is facing, do I feel like the all-volunteer force is gonna be sustainable? Um, <clears throat> yes, I do. Uh, you know, we are absolutely facing some significant recruiting headwinds right now. There's no doubt about that. And I think some of that is about, um, you know, the fact that the economy is pretty good, it's a very tight labor market, and the fact that, frankly, you know, our recruiters haven't been in schools for the last couple of years because of the pandemic. And kids, frankly, I think they're, you know, both their 
learning and their physical fitness opportunities decline because of the fan, uh, because of the pandemic. So some of that is about that. You know, but we do have a propensity challenge. You know, only about 9% of young Americans who are of age to serve in the military are inclined to serve. So that is something I think we have got to get after. And um, the data shows, you know, some of, some of I think what is um, lowering propensity or what is a barrier to propensity and getting people interested in joining the Army is they just don't really know what the Army is about. I think about 83% of the folks who are in our Army right now either um, have direct family members who've been in the military or who have extended family members who've been in the military. So these are, you know, a lot of you, I'm guessing, um, had a pretty close-up look at what military life might be like, and that's not the case for a lot of Americans. So I think we in the Army have got to do a better job of communicating what the value proposition is for the Army and what it offers to young Americans and how many different kinds of careers we offer, the kinds of benefits we offer. We just need to do a better job on that. And we do have marketing campaigns that are, that are geared towards that. Um, now, I do think the data shows that particularly for parents and influencers, there is um, some concern about, you know, what I would call sort of psychological harms. There are parents who worry about, you know, they see headlines about suicides in the military. They see headlines about sexual assault or sexual harassment in the military. And that's why, and, you know, frankly, this is maybe a good opportunity for me to say this. I was going to reserve the last sort of three minutes of my time with you all to say, um, you know, it is in part because of that, because of the perception that some Americans have about what they think uh, their kids might encounter in the Army, that it is incredibly important that all of you as young leaders really focus on doing everything you can to set a positive command climate and making sure that you are doing your part to reduce harmful behaviors in your formation. You know, we have got, we, we owe that not just to the soldiers and families who are already in the Army, but we have got to demonstrate to ourselves and to the American public that we can reduce uh, sexual harassment and things like suicide to make sure that our soldiers can, you know, truly be all they can be and that they can thrive and prosper in our Army. That is something really important. And I know that you all, you know, first of all, I know that Army senior leaders are doing a lot to focus on reducing harmful behaviors. And we've taken a number of significant steps in the last couple of years to get after that. And I think we're seeing some results. If you look at um, the, the number of suicides, for example, this year compared to last year, that number is going down. Now, we're not going to get complacent. We're not going to get overconfident. But I think it is, you know, I am cautiously optimistic that that uh, data point shows us that we are getting on the right path. But, you know, I really need you all to help us on this issue, and I know I can count on you all to um, demonstrate the kind of leadership and set the right kinds of command climate so that we can get after this. And, and again, there is, I think, a direct connection to recruiting and retention that makes uh, that focus really, really important. But, you know, so I do believe that we're going to be able to sustain the all-volunteer force. I think the future soldier prep course that we've started at Fort Jackson uh, is showing good results. We're going to need to do more than that, frankly, to, to get back up to where we want our end strength to be. Uh, but right now in the Army, to use a Navy expression, it is all hands on deck. We've got uh, ForceCom has connected our divisions to our uh, recruiting brigades so that we are, you know, again, I think really focused on making sure that our, our leadership is as visible as possible in communities. But I think we're going to be able to turn that tide. But I do think it is, a, it is going to be something that we're going to have to work on for a few years uh, to be able to get us back on the right path. Great, back to the audience, thank you. Panel three. Ma'am, Captain Head, MCCC, as the Army makes a pivot towards Chinese deterrence, do you foresee a shift in military relations with Taiwan? 
And if so, what do you believe the relationship will look like in 10 years? Thank you. Well, as you all know, uh, you know, we already do a lot to help Taiwan and to make sure that Taiwan has the capabilities it needs to defend itself. Uh, I don't foresee us changing the, the one China policy. You know, we have the six communiques and, and a variety of sort of layers of policy foundation that, um, that kind of outline our relationship with Taiwan. But, but I think we will continue to make sure that Di Taiwan has the capabilities it needs to be able to defend itself. And um, I, I think Taiwan right now is probably taking a lot of lessons from watching what's happening um, between Ukraine and Russia. And I think they're, um, I, I actually had the opportunity to go to Taiwan myself many years ago. And I think compared to where they were in the late 90s, where they are now, I think they are recognizing how much work needs to be done to think about um, how they're going to build up their defense forces, how they're going to have a defense plan against a potential amphibious invasion from, from China. So I think, you know, the, fundamentally, we would like to see, obviously, the relationship between China and Taiwan be resolved diplomatically. Uh, and not by force, and I think, you know, the bulk of um, America's policy towards Taiwan is going to be about trying to set the conditions for a diplomatic resolution um, of the tensions between China and Taiwan, but I believe that we will continue to support Taiwan and make sure that it has the capabilities to defend itself. Thank you. Back out to the audience. Panel one. Morning, Madam Secretary. This is Second Lieutenant Matthew Lay. Uh, you mentioned in your uh, six points uh, that one of the, uh, the third point was to win the firefight along with our six services. However, a couple of my buddies in the Marine Corps are, are concerned that they lack some of the capabilities such as a, a lack of heavy armor in uh, the Marine Corps to support their capability to win against near-peer threats. Do you believe that the Army is expanding to fulfill that void uh, that the Marine Corps lacks in? I think, first of all, I would say, you know, I think the Commandant has put a lot of work and thinking into the force design plan that the Marines are embarked on right now. And I think fundamentally the, the Marines leadership sees the Marine Corps really focusing on the littorals and being much lighter uh, and being much more agile in terms of being able to, you know, move around the, the islands, for example, that are so prominent in the, in the Indo-Pacific. I, you know, I think one of the things we're doing at Project Convergence, for example, is uh, working really closely with our sister services, including the Marine Corps, to think through how do we together as a joint force solve operational problems. Uh, and there is a lot of conversation, I would say, between the Army and the Marine Corps, you know, whether it's through Project Convergence or whether it's through the work that all of the services have done on the joint warfighting concept to try to make sure that we are going to be successful as a joint force. So I think, you know, I know that there's a lot of debate about the Marines' decisions to divest themselves of their tanks, um, but I think that, again, that, that is a pretty thought through. Change is always hard in my experience with large organizations, but I think, you know, we will continue to work with the Marine Corps and other services in war games, in experiments like Project Convergence, to make sure that we can sort out our roles and missions uh, and to make sure that we have capabilities that are complementary of each other. Madam Secretary, the next uh, question I'll take will be online. And this has to do, the question has to do with quality of life and it asks, um, recognizing that quality of life has been one of your top priorities, where do you see our biggest challenges as an army in the category of quality of life? for our soldiers and families, thank you. There is a lot there to unpack. Um, you know, I think we are doing a lot in the area of quality of life already, and it is incredibly important. You know, there is a reason that 
uh, General McConville and I talk about people first as much as we do, and people is one of our top three priorities. I think when I look at what do I think is most important um, in terms of quality of life right now or where we have the most work to do, it's in the area of housing. Uh, we both barracks as well as family housing. You know, we are spending on average uh, about a billion dollars a year on barracks. Uh, we, we work with a, a number, I think about five uh, major companies that, that do privatized housing for us. And I think over the last several years, you know, the Army has been so focused on, appropriately so, I think, protecting and pursuing our, our aggressive modernization um, agenda that we have in some cases, you know, with a fairly flat top line over the last few years, I think we have perhaps underinvested a little bit in housing. And so that is something that I am really, really focused on. You know, I want to make sure that our, that, you know, our soldiers, that you all, that your families have quality housing to look, to live in. And, you know, we are just, again, such an enormous organization and the inventory of our houses and our barracks in many cases is pretty old. Um, you know, that's definitely something I've been struck with as I've um, been able to visit a number of installations. I've, I have two daughters who are going to be seniors in college. They lived in a dorm their freshman year. And I've certainly seen barracks that are a lot nicer than the dorms that my daughters lived in, but I've seen a, plenty of barracks that are not as nice as the dorms my kids lived in. So that's an area where I think we've got work to do. Um, and that's something actually just yesterday I was meeting with the Secretary of Defense and talking about that. So I think that's, that's an area that I'd like to see us focus on even more going forward in terms of quality of life. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Back out to the audience and we'll go with uh, panel three, please. Good morning, Madam Secretary. Captain Packer and a triple C student. My question is, despite upgrades to the M1A2 and Bradley, many older variants will remain in the fleet across the Army. With full fielding years away in 2030 or later for newer platforms, what is the plan to address part shortages created by canceled vendor contracts due to labor shortages until that time? Thank you, ma'am. Well, I think you're absolutely right that we're going to have a number of different variants in the force, uh, you know, whether it's for our tanks or for other kinds of platforms. So I think we're going to have to be creative about how we can ensure that we've got, you know, what I would call reverse interoperability. Uh, and this is going to be particularly true, you know, as you um, look not just at the regular army, but also as you look at the guard, for example, you know, where there's probably going to be older equipment. So I think you know that's something that we're going to have to work on, and um, you know make sure that we can identify ways to 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 enable those different variants to be able to continue to work together. And I think you know to the the point about workforce um, shortfalls, you know that's something frankly that we're seeing across the board. You know whether it's as we try to develop some of these newer systems, or it's you know the workforce that's that does maintenance on some of the older platforms. Uh, as, we, as we get close to going into the, the big AUSA meeting in a couple of weeks in October, um, I usually meet with CEOs of some of the major defense industry companies, and, and I know that labor shortages is something that they are struggling with. So I think, you know, we're, we're going to just have to do what we can to try to help industry, um, but also to really you know, send the demand signal to them that says we really need them to be out there making sure that they can retain their workforce to be able to do the kind of work that we need. And I guess I would also say that we, we are trying ourselves, when we look at our own civilian workforce in some of our um, organic industrial base, you know, our depots, our arsenals, and things like that, and in a lot of places, we have programs um, in place to try to upskill some of the workforce that we have so that they're able to continue working on maintenance of, again, enduring systems as well as the newer systems that we're bringing online. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Madam Secretary, we have time for one more question. And so we'll go back out to the audience. Panel three, go ahead. 
Well, good morning, Madam Secretary. I'm uh, Captain Ellis, MCCC. Uh, recognizing the ever fluctuating budget and uh, manning issues across the Army, what is the Army's plan to maintain the same level of course uh, level with its ASI producing schools without cutting class lengths, class lengths or class size? Can you repeat that question one more time? I didn't quite catch the end of it. There was the, the budget's kind of flat and, and ha connect me to the courses again, please. Uh, my apologies. That's okay. <laughs> With an ever fluctuating budget and manning issues that we're facing, how is the Army maintaining the same level of lethality and instruction with its ASI producing courses in regards to like cutting class sizes and cutting class lengths? Well, I think, you know, um, I would assume, I'm not sure that I've had the opportunity yet to sort of dig deep into how we determine our class sizes and sort of manage the flow of, of that. But, you know, my sense would be knowing us in the Army and how well we do planning and how far ahead we try and look, I, I think TRADOC and other parts of the Army that are in charge of our professional military education really try to forecast, you know, what, what class sizes are going to be and what that means in terms of our course offerings. You know, I do think that is something, frankly, we're going to have to probably dig into a little bit more deeply given what's happening again with our overall recruiting picture and our end strength going down a little bit you know that that um there is going to be a lot that we are going to have to manage not just in terms of thinking about how we're manning the you know what manning levels we're using for units all across the army but also for sort of what we're putting into our schoolhouses so we are going to have to look at that but but given how much we value professional military education and you know as I said given that we see leader development as really core to generating the army that we need and I think it's one of our comparative advantages I think we'll work very hard to make sure that we protect the quality and quantity of PME that we offer ladies and gentlemen we are out of time for this keynote session Madam Secretary, thank you for your remarks and for joining us for the Maneuver Conference, and it's been an honor to have you with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you all. And I would just say, um, you know, I, I, I'm looking forward to going and seeing all that I'm going to see today at Fort Benning, but I looked at the agenda for the conference this week, and you all have got a lot of dynamite panels and great speakers, so there's a part of me that wishes I could stay here with you and enjoy all of it. I know that it's going to be a, a great set of sessions for you all, so thank you very much. It was great to be here.